No. So two things completely unrelated to class. Um, thank you to whoever's leaving me a new lens wipe on the pedestal for every class. Do you want to remain anonymous? <laughs> so I don't know how to take that exactly. Is it just a simple, straightforward act of kindness? Don't read anything into it? Does it mean that my glasses are distractingly smudgy to you and it, you can't get over it, so you're trying to help me out? Um, but in any event, thank you. The second thing that I've been meaning to remember but keep forgetting, and I'll have to poke my head into the ladies' class. So I was gone with COVID back in like September for a few assemblies. Um, and some lady here at the building handed my 14-year-old daughter a receipt from like Hobby Lobby or one of those crafty kind of stores? Is it your wife? No, okay. It was you? Are you sure? Because she said it was a lady. <laughs> so at first I thought, okay, Lydia, you're 14 now. Come on, you ought to do better than this. You, you know to the people, right? And then even the few people that are pretty new and you don't know, you, you, hey, what's your name? Who should I tell him gave this? But to get it wrong and it was a man, it was Dallas, that's really bad. We're going to have some good conversation on the way home. So you want reimbursed for that? Is that the, is that the point? Oh my, this is getting more and more embarrassing by the minute. Um, thank you. Well, welcome to Bible class. First Timothy, I'm enjoying this study. I uh, hope you are enjoying spending time again in the book and uh, look forward to our, our discussions about it. So, getting a running start on tonight's class, what did we talk about last time? I'm gonna try really hard to do my part to elicit a Wednesday evening dynamic, not the Sunday morning sleepyhead dynamic that we had a few days ago. Okay, so we started out with um, Timothy the person. Remember, we looked at what do we know from Scripture about him as a person and, and particularly focused in on his relationship with Paul. Then we looked at uh, what was Timothy's role? Was it just a run-of-the-mill evangelist minister of the gospel, a preacher at a, at a local church, or was it more than that, different than that? And then we started a, an overview of the letter, right? So what, uh, what do you remember, what would you say is the most salient points we got out of the discussion about Timothy the person? What did you take away from that? His ethnicity. Yeah. He was young. Uh, so ethnicity. You know, because you use the word ethnicity, it just kind of caused my brain to go a different direction. But uh, I kind of assume that when when the term Greek gets used in the New Testament, that it's um, as opposed to Jewish, that it's kind of interchangeable with Gentile. Now, maybe that's mistaken. Maybe he was literally Greek. Uh, where did Paul find him? Hmm? 
Lister and Derby, and where, where, where are those towns? I'm paying more attention to Greece, uh, Greek geography uh, than I ever have in my life because in like, I don't know, two weeks, two and a half weeks, I'm supposed to go there, and um, so it's of more interest to me. But I think those are, that's northern Greece, right? So it could be that he was literally Greek. Right? Um, wow, that's nice. Um, but the overwhelming majority of instances in the New Testament where there is talk about a spiritual gift, it's talking about a supernatural, miraculous uh, ability granted by the Holy Spirit. So I think that makes sense. Uh, a younger evangelist, not in the presence of the apostle at all times, having to be in a position of authority and teaching and leading, making sure things are going the way they're supposed to in a congregation or congregations that he worked. Uh, is that too loud? No? Okay. Uh, all right, what else? Yes. Yes. So you, um, you would come to have a high opinion of Timothy if you read everything about him in the Scripture. Um, admittedly, that's through the lens of Luke and Paul, but Paul clearly thought very highly of him. If you were to uh, rank the, the Paul friends, right, Paul's circle of people, by the end of his life, who do you think human beings that he knew personally, if he were to rank them like my most loyal, the one I can most count on, uh, where do you think Timothy would be? One or two? I mean, you might have Silas up there, you might have Luke up there, but uh, from his writings, his prison epistles, Clearly, Luke, uh, I'm, Timothy was uh, very trusted and um, very valued, very close personal emotional connection. 
Yes. Right. In fact, Paul refers to Timothy as his child so many times in letters to Timothy and letters to other people about Timothy that it makes you think about the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> They're like, wait a minute, did, did Paul miss the, uh, you know, call no man father, call no man teacher, call no rabbit? Because he calls him his child in the faith, my spiritual child in the faith uh, so many times. Uh, but it wasn't a title, right? It wasn't an effort to elevate Paul in some kind of uh, way. It was just uh, addressing, uh, observing the very close relationship that they had. So when you look closely at what we know about Timothy, I think the takeaway is a very impressive, not that we're trying to impress each other, right? But he was a admirable uh, young man, a Christian of, of character and of faith, uh, of zeal for his, his mission. And, and Paul thought very highly of him. Yeah. Yeah, and it reminds me of a, this is a quick aside. I think I got this from Jason Moore. I think I got this from Jason Moore, a sermon in Portage back in, I don't know, 20-aught something. But uh, it's a sermon about Barnabas. And one of the practical lessons was about, um, he called it good gossip. You ever heard that? Good gossip? It, it, it's, it's when you talk behind someone's back about them, but you're talking complimentary about them, and it's genuine. It's not flattery, right? Uh, it's not exaggerated. You really think well of this person, and you're talking uh, about them behind their back. It's good gossip. And I was just sharing this with one of my daughters, helping her write a paper, dual enrollment English, right? And um, was observing this very point that which is more powerful to you, how is more impactful to you, more meaningful to you? Is it when someone walks right up to you and says, you know, you're a great guy, I really appreciate, you know, you're, you're sharp and you're efficient and you're all these things? That's A. Or B, you find out maybe days, weeks after it happened, that I went up to this other, maybe a mutual friend or a coworker or someone else, and I said, you know, David McCrary, I really think well of him. He's really sharp, he's responsible, he's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you find out about it. Which one's more weighty? Second one is. The first one, we have a natural tendency in the back, somewhere back in here, we're thinking, okay, <laughs> are you buttering me up? Um, are, you, are you just like exaggerating a little bit because you're being nice, right? Um, we have a way of like not fully trusting that in, in some cases, right? But when it's thir third hand, you either got to be really cynical. You got to really think there's a conspiracy going on about you that all your people are, you know, masterminding some kind of uh, cruel hoax on you that they're going to say things that aren't true about you around your back that are positive and then hope that randomly you know you find out about it weeks or months or years later right yeah that ain't happening so it's genuine and it's it's powerful and so um yeah timothy we haven't heard a single word timothy said have we but we have a very high impression of him from what other people have said about him So we've already established, well established, uh, Paul's regard for him. And I'm going to make the argument uh, again that I think that Timothy's role was something more, something extra from a, an evangelist. Um, because of the way Paul writes to him, he, he uses the word charge repeatedly. Uh, he talks about a deposit. That's the word on Sunday I couldn't think of later in the class. But this deposit, um, Timothy had a, a special role that was, uh, it appears, more than a run-of-the-mill 
uh, evangelist or, or preacher. So in terms of overall uh, scope of the letter, we find this uh, statement tucked in the middle of the book where Paul said that he hoped to come see Timothy soon, but in, in case he's delayed, he's writing this letter in part so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Well, if that's what he's writing, then what would, he, would we expect to find in the letter? There's six chapters, the way we've got it divided up. A lot of instructions about how one ought to behave, and that's exactly, uh, that makes up the biggest content of the book. Um, so the, the house of God, we, we understand that's not literally a, a building, right? We're, we're not talking about, they didn't have church buildings so far as we know. Uh, they met in, in, you know, private homes or public. Uh, you know, the early church in Jerusalem met in the temple porches. Uh, they met house to house. They, they could have met in the school of Tyrannus. You know, they, they met in various places, uh, the river, um, in a prison cell. So we're not talking about a structure, we're talking about the family, uh, the house or the household of God, uh, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So we all, we're familiar with the ecclesia, the called out ones. Uh, the pillar is a, is a column, a support, and then you've got the, the ground, the bulwark, the support, the base. So uh, just some words that are used here that in, in principle, in, uh, in um, conceptually describes what church is in God's plan. Uh, it's the family, it's the people who are called out, and their role is to be a visible, strong presence in the world. Uh, we, we support the truth, uh, we stand for the truth, uh, we are a, a, a visible representation of the truth, So I fleshed this out a little bit um, since Sunday. So there's a good bit of information about Timothy personally, instructions to him personally, like the taking wine instead of just water, you know, give attention to the public readings, uh, his work. Um, there are, and I, I'm not prepared to, to call these out tonight, but I, I definitely want to take some time during one of our remaining class periods. There are some, uh, several, fundamental statements of, of faith uh, that I think are worth highlighting and noticing some trends, themes among them in the same letter. Um, there are instructions about relationships among brethren, how we ought to behave in the household of God, right? How we ought to treat one another. And even more specifically than that, but how we ought to behave with we are functioning as a church collectively. In, 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 I'm picturing in an assembly uh, environment. A lot of warnings about strange doctrines. We'll circle back to that in a minute. Um, this faithful saying worthy of full acceptance, I'll circle back to that in a minute. There, there are um, instructions about positions in the church roles in the church. The obvious ones are the pastors, also known as, what are the two other pastors, conveys the idea of shepherding, right, the role of leading a flock, right, but there's two other titles, words that are used for the same office that convey somewhat different aspects of the role. Overseer, right, that's the authority, Bishop is the same as overseer. Elders, which conveys this is an older person, a, a wiser, a more mature person seasoned in the faith, right? So those, those three words refer to the same uh, office. Then there's another, pretty clear to me from passages uh, that there, are, there was another office in the church um, that is intended to continue perpetually, uh, unlike apostle, right? Um, 
which is deacons, which the word means servant, right? But we're all to be servants, little s. Some people are called and have to qualify to be deacons in a, in a formal capacity that are, um, that are appointed to that, to that office, to that role. And then here's the, here's the, uh, the surprising one, um, is widows. Um, there's a sense that anyone who is, uh, has lost her husband, of course, is a widow. I mean, you're, you're, you're a widow, you're qualified, okay, you're a widow. But from the context, it seems pretty clear that it was permitted in some situations for some widows to be put in a special category where they would be, I think, probably supported in some way, and they would have a, um, a special commitment, a pledge, uh, the term is used, that they would serve the church. And so there's some widows who are widows, but they're not widows indeed, and they may not be widows, even if they're widows indeed, they may not be widows who qualify to be put in this special class, right? Like you have to be 60 years old or older. Uh, younger widows can be widows, they can be widows indeed, they can be good people, but they cannot, they do not qualify for this special um, category of, of widows in the church. There's some specific instructions to men as a class, women as a category, slaves, and rich people. I think that pretty much covers most of the, the content of the book. Now, let's go back to the warnings about strange doctrines. So if you want to get a helper to make this go faster, you can, or if you want to just pass out yourself. But tonight, all I want to do with this spreadsheet is introduce it and ask you to take it home, put it in your Bible, and before Wednesday, no, today's Wednesday, before Sunday, please spend some time with it and give some thought to it, because I'd like to have a more meaningful discussion that includes you guys having, some, having had some time to uh, chew on this, okay? Yes, yeah, don't literally chew on it. It's not legible after you do that. So one thing I noticed as I read through the book, listened through the book over and over again, and I noticed this you know, in years past, but it, 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 I'm reminded of it every time I go through it, is how many statements Paul makes cautioning Timothy, warning Timothy to watch out for what in some, what in some um, versions, not in my ESV that I used here, ESV says, calls different doctrine, but in some of your trans, I think New American Standard, I think, says strange doctrines. And so that ca caught my attention. Like, wow, there's a lot of references to these one-off teachings, kind of bizarro land. Like, one, you know, curiosity is like, why, why was that such a problem? Why were there so many people and so many, why was it such a temptation? And what were these teachings? Uh, and so I just started... Um, kind of collecting those references. And I tried to organize it in some way that made sense to me, and I'm not entirely happy with what I came up with, but so far, up till now, it's the best I've come up with, which is looking at the statements, some of them seem to be addressing the cause, like why do people do this, what's their motivation, where, where does it start, where does it originate? Then most of them are the symptoms of the problems, the visible behavior that you would, you would observe uh, that you can describe, and then in some cases there's some effects or consequences, results that come from this behavior or these teachings, right? So in red are the, are the words, you know, these are the strange, the, the, the references to the strange doctrines, the way they're described. Uh, in the blue, the bold blue is the truth, the gospel of Christ, 
what, what these people are deviating from. And then underlined are, are, are various other phrases or words that I, I thought were relevant. So uh, if you would, your, your assignment to accept it is to spend time with this, notice any transactions, if you, if you have any uh, observations that you want to engage in a robust conversation on Sunday morning. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Now, before we get to uh, uh, part B of my uh, speech about a faithful saying worthy of full acceptance, which we talked about a little bit last time, I want to just get this out in the open, okay? And I haven't decided yet. There's still time left to decide whether I run and avoid these at all costs, or we've got time, you know, maybe in the fourth class to face these, turn right into them, and just face your fears and, and address them. But... Um, here you go. These are four passages that I think prevent, present some difficulty. By that I mean, I, I'm not sure how to explain them. I'm not sure how to tell you what they mean confidently. So one of them is chapter 2, verse 15, talking about women and how they are to um, not, uh, he, he says that he doesn't permit women to teach or have authority over, over a man, but to, to be silent. And he says, yet she... I think that referring to women generally, she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. I have a guess at that. Not sure. Not confident. Uh, by the way, with all of these, it's implied that I'm inviting you to um, study up on that and be ready to give a... Um, an explanation, a biblical explanation. Chapter 4, verse 10, For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those of, who believe. A little tricky. I think, uh, I think I can say pretty simply what I think that means, uh, but a little tricky. Chapter 5, verse 21, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. So Paul has issued how many instructions by this point in the letter to Timothy? A lot. I mean, dozens? And at this point in the letter, he chooses to preface this particular instruction which is to keep the rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality, he decides to weight it up, load it up with this extra oomph, which is in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, okay, I'm okay, I, I got you there, but then, and of the elect angels, as if being in the presence of God and Christ Jesus is not quite authoritative enough, I want you to know that the elect angels are present as I charge you. Okay, so do you have a comment on that later? <laughs> Let me, you want to do it right now? Me too, because it doesn't affect my life. I don't think it affects my life. If I get it wrong, I'm like, okay, I got it wrong. But if I get number... Um, you know, some of these other ones seem to be more relevant to, to, uh, to me and my life. Okay. 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 Wow, I'm, I'm feeling very relieved that we don't have four difficult passages to tackle in the, uh, that, seems, that seems, on the surface, that seems pretty credible. All right, the last one is more of a general thing. 
So notice in chapter 2, verse 12, I, I made reference, this is the, the previous context of the first passage. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain, si to remain quiet. This is this phrase here, I do not permit. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's writing instructions to Timothy, who is charged with having some kind of instructional oversight role in a, in a, in a fledgling young church. And, and Paul is passing on these instructions, and he uses the language, I do not permit. Now you put that in conjunction with chapter 5, verse 14, where he says, talking about widows, so I would have... So I would have younger widows marry, bear children. And, and then when you add in that there's 11 instances in the letter where he just starts, starts a sentence, starts a, an instruction with let. Let this happen. Let, let young people do this. Let old people do this. Let, right? So navigating the weight of that the relative weight of that. So I do not permit, if I take that straightforwardly, I think that is an apostle saying, these are the rules in God's church. But then when I come to 514, so I would have younger widows marry, bear children, I don't believe that Paul is saying, if you find yourself a younger widow, if you're less than 60 years old and you're 58 or you're 47, that you have to marry? I don't think he's requiring them to marry and bear children. I think he's expressing probably his, his preference, his desire, right? And then you've got these 11 times where it says, let this happen, let this happen. So, uh, again, because the nature of inspiration, Paul, in the, in the first and second Corinthian letters especially, says, uses phrases sometimes like, um, I say this, you know, this is my opinion, not, you know, it's not of the Lord. Uh, I think I have the spirit of the God on this as well. He says things like that in his letter. So there are some instances where we have to discern and come to a proper conclusion of what is the weight on that, right? I, I don't think there's anybody in this room, and there's probably nobody that you know personally who's not in this room, that some of the greetings later in some of the epistles, like greet one another with a holy kiss, means that you literally must use that method of greeting, right? Um, and so that's a struggle for me is, is um, making sure we put the right weight, the right authority on some of those um, statements where it's not clear, it may not be clear, uh, what the intention is. All right. Let's go back to uh, trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Paul says this three times, uh, two times exactly the same way, and one time he just says it's a trustworthy statement. So here are the three times. It's uh, chapter 1, verse 15, chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 8. So faithful is the word or in the English standard, it's this saying is trustworthy. Literally, it's pistos ho logos. Faithful is the word. And it's a point of emphasis, isn't it? The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So it's deserving of full acceptance, the greatest level of acceptance, the highest, the very best acceptance.
And it, it just strikes me that this is just one more way for an apostle of Jesus Christ to make an appeal to people, to whoever his audience is. In this case, it's Timothy, but by extension, that will get shared with Christians in Timothy's circle. And now here it comes a couple thousand years later in writing to us. And here's a man who was living one way. He had his life all planned out, and it was going pretty well. But something happened to him while he was traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus. And it changed his life. Not just a little bit. It totally changed his life diametrically changed his direction. He was putting everything he had into this way of life. And after an episode that probably lasted a few minutes, and then the fallout from that over the next few days, and from that moment on, until his neck, his head was separated from his shoulders, in a Roman prison, he was all in for Jesus Christ. And so coming from that man, when he says, this is a trustworthy statement, faithful is this word that I'm about to tell you. It's worthy of full acceptance. And he describes it there in chapter 4. To this end, we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God. That's what it all, that's what, it's all about that. There's nothing else that even comes close to being as important as that. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a phrase that's easy to gloss over. I think it's better to uh, notice it and let it impact uh, what he, why he said it that way, what it meant to him. I think that's what he's hoping for, is that that appeal will come through. It's interesting that um, this phrase is only used in... 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy one time, and Titus one time. Of course, those are both Pauline letters, right? It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. It's used only five times, and it's all used right here in these letters. Maybe because they're young Christians, and he's, and he's trying to uh, make a, a really strong, heartfelt appeal. Okay, now here's where I'm going to make another invitation to you. Um, I am, um, I'm, I'm leading the discussion, but I want you to feel comfortable s asking questions, um, affecting the agenda, right? So there's two classes left after tonight. So if you want to, uh, if there's something in the book that you want to spend some time on, please let me know. No one said anything to me yet, okay? Um, so we have to go on talking about Timothy and, uh, I get, to, I get to lead the discussion. So here we go. Passage of interest, at least to me. Cha and we're going basically through chapter 1, uh, starting with chapter 1 and just hitting some highlights here. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 9, after he's given the first warning in that first paragraph about these strange doctrines, and describing them a little bit and what the problem is with these people and why it's deviating from, from the truth. Verse 8, he says, Now we know that the law is good. That's exactly what you expect Paul to say about the law. He says it a lot in Romans and other, other passages. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, 
the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers. That struck me. Uh, I expect him to say the law is uh, good. What do you make of the law is not laid down for the just? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Heal the healthy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Other thoughts? Okay. Okay. This is an intentionally sufficient pause so that there can be no one who says, I was going to say something, but I didn't, I didn't have enough time. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't delay long enough. Right, Jesus? Nobody's going to say that to me. Right, okay. Now notice my, my retort to Chris, uh, my response to Chris is, I don't think he's pointing out that the law is going to be ignored by certain people. It's even more fundamental than that, which is the law is not laid down for the just. The law is not written. It is not advertised. It is not presented for the just, the righteous. So it's hard to conjure an illustration that captures it because there's always exceptions. Like you think about traffic laws. Some of these, some traffic laws, I think, are this way, but other traffic laws, no. Like, for instance, we, I, I was talking to, we, we live in a place now where um, the, an intersection we always pass through, there's construction, so they put, uh, bear, you know, like those, um, you know, those kind of ah, ah, words, English. Um, so it's a kind of a wall of horizontal slats, and you can have letters up there, and it kind of can, it can either be blocking the lane or it can be off to the side, right? So four-way four -way, four, uh, intersection, two, this one stops. Both of them have to stop. This one does not right away. No stop. No slow down, no stop. These guys have to stop. Well, the barricades are right here. And what started happening was the people coming this way saw the barricades and they thought, well, there's no one coming through there. So they just, they just go. Well, we're driving this way a lot. And I'm like, there's going to be an accident. Meredith went so far as to talk to police officers and send them emails and you know, go up the chain of command and say, look, you're going to have a problem here. So they, they took the barricades off the road and backed them up. So they're, not, they're on the side of the road. Well, guess what? That didn't, that didn't, do, that didn't fix it. Because people see the barricade and they still think, well, you know, that's a stop sign. They're going to they're stop or no one's coming. 
Then they moved it off the intersection a ways. It helped some, but still, tonight we're coming to church. It just pulled right out in front of me. Just and so, my point being that some traffic laws are not for the lawless. They're to have a, an, an agreed-upon arrangement, right? Like right-of-way and, you know, when you come to a stop sign, isn't it clockwise? Isn't it clockwise you're supposed to go if you all come at the same time? Okay, more or less, okay. Uh, but there's other laws that are clearly only intended for idiots, can I just put it bluntly? They're only intended for knuckleheads, okay? Like, there's a law that says you can't change lanes, you know, uh, willy-nilly and, you know, three times a second and without turn signals. Well, you know what? Respectable people who ought to be driving already know that. <laughs> and so if you put a law that says you can't do that, it's, who's it for? Why was that law created? For the lawless, right? For the unruly, for the rebellious. It wasn't created for my dad. No, my dad's a safe driver. He's intrinsically, innately, inherently a safe driver, right? I mean, he's the one who called Allstate, you know, 25 years ago and said, hey, you ought to give this, you know, good, not good driver discount. I'm, not, I'm paying too much. I'm making that part up. But that's how good of a driver he is. Uh, Richard Buchanan, you know, uh, all these responsible senior citizens uh, who know how to behave on the road. That's not why these speed limits, speed limits are not written for them, right? So it just, it just was striking to me, kind of, kind of shocking, that I don't think of God's law as being that way. But I think if you chase that back far enough, you might be coming to the conclusion that, look, if you are made in the image of God, right? You're made in the image of God. If you are walking by the Spirit, in the Spirit, then you're going you're gonna to want the heart of God. You're going to want the will of God. You're going to be seeking that, right? And so, do you, what did Paul tell the Thessalonians? You don't need anybody to teach you about love because God has taught you the love of God. God does that. What about, what about faith? What about hope? What about, what about uh, peace? What about gentleness? The fruit of the Spirit? You, you see my point? That if you are a child of God who's made in the image of God, and your heart is bent on God, you're not having to go here to find out, you know, what is, what, what, what's my life all about? Uh, should I be hurting people? Should I be lying to people? Well, I don't know. Let me check the word here. No, you know this is good, this is right, this is proper, and these things are not proper, Right? All right, we're going to, um, just to give you a preview, here's, here's where I'd like to go next. This phrase in, in chapter 1, verse 10, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, he doesn't list everything that's contrary to sound doctrine, does he? How long could the list be? What do you make of the fact that he doesn't try to list everything? What do you make of the fact that he gives a representative sample and then says, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine? I think that fact has some, some weight, some power, some impact. Uh, chapter 1, verse 12 through 16, the case of Paul, but I received mercy. I think it's v fascinating the way he just talks about himself and his history and why he received mercy. I'd like to, I'd like to dwell, d delve into that a little more. And then, uh, 2 verse 5, there is one mediator between God and man, the man, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay? So we got the spreadsheet, and we've got these passages. You want to take a picture of that? Um, that's where I'd like to camp out for next class.